Right. Can everyone see and hear? Wave or something if you can. And apologies, I had a strong coffee about 20 minutes ago, so if I'm a bit jumpy, it's that. Plus, it's really exciting to see everyone, uh, even if it's virtual. So this is a story about childhood. Uh, it's about a place. It's about a shared space. This space, this is a map I did of Simonstown way back when in the early 60s. And that place is gone. Uh, apartheid ripped the town apart. And part of the reason I wrote a book was to remember so that we never forget what happened during that period. But the talk will mostly look at childhood. Uh, and in the book, I cover that plus the background um, to apartheid and what was happening at the time. So, as Tasneem said, my, our family migrated to South Africa in 1959. And for us, it was a new beginning. The journey took, I had to look this up. 12 days, it was 6,000 miles, and it was anything up to 670 passengers on board. But my brother, Paul and Claire, remember the passage. That's me in the picture down at the bottom. Uh, I was two, so I have absolutely no memory of that passage in the journey. None of the rituals on board. I don't remember seeing England disappear from view. What I do remember is when we arrived in England, but we were, Migrants, like many others, millions of others who left England at the time. And the rat there is re a reference to Winston Churchill. So many people left at the time. He likened us to rats deserting a sinking ship. So that's us rats there. And Africa shaped my childhood. And what I aim to do in the book and touch on this evening really is to look at from a child's eye point of view what life was like then in Simonstown. The Group Areas Act which separated races in inverted commas was pushing through much of South Africa, Cape Town, but it hadn't reached us yet in Simonstown. And that's something I only realized really in retrospect with the benefit of hindsight so that was a space we inhabited as kids, Simonstown, although this is a more recent photo. So we lived in the rectory, which was on the side of the mountain, looking over the sea. We could see the whales come in twice a year. And in the rectory, that's our singing grace. Every evening, six o'clock or thereabouts, we sang that song. Uh, that's us five kids around the table. And there were five kids of us, which was a handful for my mum. Uh, so I reference in the book, Granny Matthews, who came to help the family. And we had cousins in Cape Town, but no other immediate family. And she became an important part of the family, Granny Matthews. She was there every day, she cooked, she helped out. Uh, that's a photo of some of us, not me, but my brother Paul was in the bottom left there, looking delighted to be holding that candlestick. And that's Joost de Blanc there uh, when he turned up to St. Francis for a ceremony. And uh, I only found out recently it was the first Anglican church in South Africa, St. Francis. Some photos of the time. It's very much a multicultural parish. Yost is surrounded by some of the parishioners there. That might be the back of my head or Paul's, I'm not sure which. Probably me with the ears there. And the rectory was the venue for the parish and many events were held there as well as in the town hall and so on. Uh, so that's one, here's another. Uh, my dad had done athletics and gymnastics. So he got kids on board. And I think that's my sister Bubba, who is the only African amongst us. She was actually born in South Africa. The rest of us came to the country. And then us friends. 
And that's one of the abiding memories of Simon's Town is that it was a shared space, a space that we could share on the streets. And in the book, I touch on some of the small vignettes of our lives there. Tops, spinning tops were one of the things we did. I don't know you get them anymore. Dangerous, someone lost an eye actually from a, a top, but that was the, one of the things we'd do on the street. That's actually not in Simonstown. That's a photo I, I nicked from my dad, from his collection. And local kids would build go-karts from pram wheels and such like. And it was steep on the streets around our area. So it wasn't a, as safe as it might look. Those, one suggestion was actually to go from one side of the hill to the other when a car or truck was passing, but luckily we didn't do that one. Uh, that's Star's Sweets on the left and Simba Chips. Star's because I was never allowed them, but my mates would supply them to me. And my dad would ask, have you been eating them? Because the telltale sign was if you stuck your tongue out, the red dye was so bad that it would show immediately. Uh, and we weren't allowed them. So it, all the better for not being allowed. We also had very big and important debates. Who was better, Albus or Cliff? To be honest, I have no idea what I said. I might shamefully have said Cliff Richard. Benefit of hindsight, obviously not him. And uh, we used to serve us boys in church. My dad was quite high church, so there was a lot of ceremony there. There was incense burners. We had the candles and so on and so forth. And one of the boys, not us, I think he lost focus and singed his fringe. Dangerous, the scollies were dangerous. They were mythic figures for us kids there. You kept clear of them because we thought they had flick knives. And the drunken sailors at times, you would see sailors who'd gone too far on the streets of Simonstown. And in the book, I share a story about on the mountain top there, there was a waterfall. And us kids could go up there, uh, just hang out. And baboons would often visit. And there was one time we decided it was a good idea to chuck little stones at the baboons. And in return, rocks came flying back at us. And there was only one winner. Those rocks, we had to duck and then run for it because that was a dangerous thing. Uh, one of the things I suggested was that, just like a fish doesn't know it lives in water, I think friends are the colour of water, and for us anyway, colour or race mattered, didn't, not at all, we didn't consider race. But at the time, it was evident, you know, as we grew older, that there were separate races sharing a single space. So I put that in a book as separate races, but shared spaces. And I'll show some examples. So I think it was about four or five when the film Tarzan Goes to India. I looked it up. It did come out around that time. Tarzan Goes to India. We don't know why, but it did. And it was my first trip to the cinema with my mates. It's age about five. But in Simonstown Cinema, there was a section for whites and then non-whites had to sit upstairs. So I had to go on my own and sit and the left hand side there when everyone else went upstairs. And it was the first time, so I saw all these empty seats at the front and I didn't realize why they were empty. It was a big mistake sitting at the front because as soon as the lights went down, there was all sorts got chucked over the balcony from up above there. Banana skins, empty bottles, crisp packets, whatever. It all came flying down. And that was my pals up there and me suddenly having to make a shift from the front seat. And also because I was very frightened by Tarzan jumping out of the plane. I walked out one point halfway through the film because I was on my own. Anyway, poor me. Uh, I then went to school at age four. Uh, Sister Valana was my teacher and shamefully for me, I cried the whole first day. That was her nickname. And I can remember in maths doing um, arithmetic and we had pounds, shillings and pence when I first started. And in 1961, it changed, the coinage changed. 
So we had to one D there on the left is one P. I don't know why it is, but it was. And then it changed to cents. And we had to do the times tables, 12 times tables and so on and so on. But South Africa decimalized before England did. And we had to learn a new system. But one thing I point out in the book is what we didn't know was steadily creeping was apartheid, was pushing down the amount of money spent on each school kid. So us whites were getting 644 rand per, on average per head. Colors about 139 and black people 44 rand per head. Not something we knew at the time. And uh, many friends in Simonstown, one group we befriended was the Ajahn family. One of the boys would cycle up the hill to the rectory uh, with samosas in the front basket, hot samosas. And we loved the samosas, except not very good with the spices. So every week they'd come up and we'd have a samosa there. And gradually over time, there was a friendship developed. That's the portrait of my sister Rachel there and uh, her friends. And uh, one of the stories was of going to swim at the seaside and we decided we'd go to one of the white beaches because they were all demarcated for different colours and there were white beaches and non-white beaches. And <clears throat> one day we came along with one of the Abjang girls, Ferosa, and the warden came along and she had to duck under the water while we all protected her from the eyes of the warden there because it was illegal to swim on the white beach. And this is where I'm going to pass over to my brother Paul because he's going to be taking over the story of the Ajahn family. And over to Paul Winter. Thank you. Hello. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Ajam family. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they were a key uh, group that we had uh, contact with. And uh, they played an enormous role not only on our family, but also um, in terms of an impact on my father and in relation to um, intercommunication between different uh, religious groups. And at this point in time, I'm just going to read from uh, an excerpt of, uh, from my father's book. And this relates to the con first contact that our family had with Mr. Ajam within about two months of us arriving. So this is in 1959. This is an excerpt from my father's book, uh, Just People. It says he was sitting quietly on a stool in a corner. There was nothing about his manner of dress to indicate that he was a religious man, a devout member of his faith. I approached, introduced myself, and shook hands in the Muslim style. First the full hand, then the clasp of the thumbs, then the full hand again. Mr. Ajam, I've come to, to you for help. A colored family has lost everything they possess. I faltered and then continued. They're not members of your faith. They're very poor fisher folk who belong to my congregation in Glen Cairn. His face was impassive and now I nervously waited for his comment. The shop is yours, father. Take what you like. I could hardly believe my ears. He summoned one of his daughters. Hanifa, give the father whatever he needs. Don't charge him. It's for the poor. And I think this really shows how different religious groups can combine to have a really important impact on poor people and this was true not only in 1959, but I think also very key now. 
The second story I want to talk about relates to one of my best friends when I was in uh, Simonstown, Daryl Felix, who's on the left-hand side of this uh, picture. This is us going swimming in a pond in uh, Elgin. And it speaks to how in this, despite the fact that apartheid was starting to have its impact, this really didn't matter. And Daryl was one of my best friends, uh, regardless of color, creed and the like. Unfortunately, one of the impacts on us having contact with non-white people was that some of the other white people in the community didn't like that. And there was a period of time when I was coming back from school where I was bullied by some white boys that lived near to us. I mentioned this to Daryl one day and he said that he would sort them out. The approach that he took was a bit like the approach that Marlon Brando took in The Godfather, which was in a physical way, he made them an offer that they couldn't refuse. And luckily, and thanks to Daryl, uh, I wasn't bullied again uh, by these individuals. The final bit that I want to share with you is something that really had a huge impact on me when I was there and had a formative impact on my view of apartheid and the racial consequences uh, of that. We'd, our family had been out for an outing in the Cape area and uh, on the way back near to the Spotty Dog, uh, which was a, a small building that looked like a dog, um, we came across an accident. A young black girl in crossing the road had been knocked over and was bleeding profusely. If you remember, recall the time, this was before mobile phones, and people were having difficulty making contact with the emergency services. Well, eventually, an ambulance did turn up, but it was for whites only, and refused to take her. My father was really concerned for her safety, and picked her up and asked me to sit next to her in the back of the car. I must have been about 11 at the time. And on the journey to Hrutskir Hospital, I realized that in any other circumstances, this could be me. Unfortunately, by the time we arrived at the hospital, she was dead. And on reflection, I realized that, you know, in other circumstances, this could have been me. And it had a lifelong impact on me in terms of my view of apartheid and what was wrong with it. My final point that I want to make is memory is quite a strange thing. When we're young, we mostly rely on photographic uh, memory up until about the age of six. But then after that, emotion and other aspects of our brain kick in and that's how we remember it. Three years ago, I went back to South Africa and I made contact with a number of people and I drove past the spotty dog and this incident came back to me and had such a vivid impact on me that I had to stop the car I was driving in and pull over. I was shaking so much. So this was a tragic incident that had happened that had a huge informative impact on me. And yet I'd sublimated because it was, had such a powerful impact, but had a lasting one. So not initially it was a, a negative incident, but had a positive out outcome in terms of um, my approach on life. Um, so welcome back everybody. So now this is the Q and A session of, um, the Q and A section of this session. Um, and uh, I want to know if there are any questions that anybody has that they would like to pose to Paul, Mark. Um, when you do, if you do have a question, it would be helpful if you can unmute yourself um, and then you can go ahead. Sometimes Zoom is a little bit intimidating to people to ask questions. And if you are intimidated, you can just type it in the chat for us and then we will pose it to Paul and Mark. Um, but yeah. Anybody? Okay. Uh, I, I, this is Rob Adams speaking. I, I, I raised my hand I see electronically. So. Wow. I'm kind of 
doing this medium all day and every day and it's part of the way we do things these yeah. days but, i mean paul and mark i mean paul i've seen over the last few years a couple of times and you know we've we've uh, re-established our friendship which was i guess broken by by paul's father having been expelled from south africa during the 1970s and then we re-established that friendship later mark i also knew but i haven't had any contact with him in the last god knows how many decades mm. uh, but it was guys it was a really great rendition of a special family story and i'm waiting for chapter two which would be your namibian experience <laughs> i'm hoping that you'll be back with us to do that at a later occasion so that's me done well thanks for that rob yeah and lovely to see you again after these many years uh yeah the that's the first edition of slung cup i don't know if you, i can see it second edition just printed uh yesterday or the day before and hopefully yeah there will be another book um but give me time it took a year and a half to do the first one um so i i have some questions for you guys if that's okay if i can just be a bit for and ask you some questions um so i wanted to ask you about the process leading up to writing this book and what in, what kind of inspired you to use this medium of um visual graphic novels and as a way to tell your story um maybe if you can just tell us a little bit about that process of writing this book and how you got to the point where you decided that this is going to be the medium that you want to tell your story through i guess okay yeah i i was ill i was diagnosed with uh, late stage cancer finding a way of communicating with my family and friends about it and i turned to cartoons because a lot of things were not being said by me or by others to protect each other and from that a friend of mine estelle said mark you've got to do the same for your story about south africa and uh, i'm now retired and i've run out of excuses is the long and the short of it and as i i thought oh, well i'll give it a go and the other side of it is i felt i wanted to do a child's eye view and this cartoon graphic style of imagery i thought would be really well suited to it um so that's probably the the short answer and um i mean there's a lot of young people who do these you know creative types of work what kind of advice would you give would you give young people today living in ocean view for example who yeah. might be three generations that's a big question. yeah that's a really big question because i wasn't interested just in recording the past this is very much about the present and the future and about the kind of future that we want to see and i would love it if other people would take this up because the young are the future mm. and the only advice i'd give is i don't see myself as an artist maybe you know a minor illustrator now and uh, i don't think that's the the biggest barrier the barrier is actually just getting started and that's probably what a lot of people would say make a start and you'll find actually something will probably happen has name if i could chip yeah. in um i think the various ways in which one can express oneself uh the main thing is to to do so uh mark took the 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 journey of expressing himself through cartoons and and text uh there are other ways such as singing um i happen to sing in a choir but rap and modern there are modern ways of of projecting yourself your emotions as well as uh being able to comment about the situation which is equally uh, effective mm -hmm. so find the medium that works for you and be passionate about it yeah the other thing is that i mean i'm sure other places also have this this um difficulty is that a lot of the elderly people who live through the experience of forced removals they um struggle to communicate that experience to to the younger generation as well so you have a generation of young people who don't necessarily understand the extent um 
of going through uh, the forced removals, what kind of impact it had on them, their lives, etc. So, um, yeah. So I, I don't know, even for, for, for the elderly, what kind of, um, do you have any ideas for, for how to open up that conversation, an intergenerational conversation? Well, I think uh, with, I think it's very important and can be very effective where you link young people with elderly people. Mm -hmm. There are examples now in Europe, for instance, in Germany and other enterprising countries where they don't rely on this separation of generations. And uh, by actually linking young kids with elderly people, it, it actually empowers and energizes elderly people and encourages them to reminisce about their past, which is not only healthy from a mental point of view for the elderly people, but also very important in terms of emotional development for the young people as well. Yeah. Um, Chanel, I don't know if you have any other questions for... Are there any, any other questions from anybody else? Anyone? And then um, I think maybe my... I don't know if you have any closing statements or uh, thoughts that you might want to make. Um, Mark or Paul? Do you want to go first, Paul? Well, I mean, Africa really touched our hearts. You can see in the background a photograph. It's a bit sort of uh, travel weary. This is actually a photograph taken on the day that we left Simestown. And I think I speak for my family that we still feel very emotionally attached to Simestown and Africa. Robert earlier mentioned about our connection with, with Namibia. And having just recently uh, traveled back there, um, it was extraordinary to be able to reconnect with people like Rob and others, Mary, uh, that I hadn't seen for quite some time. And so I think if you've had uh, some important part of your life, if you shared that with someone, even with the passage of time, it doesn't take much to reconnect and reestablish that connection with, with individuals. Yeah, and I think it's so important to remember, we should never forget this period. Uh, it's not about nostalgia, it's about, like I said, about the kind of present and the future we'd like to see. And through the connections we've made through doing this with Chanel and yourself, Tasneem, I know there are initiatives and I'm hoping that in the future we'll be able to get stronger connections there between ourselves outside of South Africa and what's going on in the ground there. You know, because like, I'd like to see solidarity there between ourselves and you. One thing we've managed to do, for those who don't know, is we've donated 50 copies, Paul and I, of my book, the second edition, uh, to the Museum and to Chanel's um, Museum of Childhood. And that's for the use of the museums, as they say, see fit. And it's possible, I don't know, that you know, Ocean View, maybe the secondary school, would like to see a set of, of the book. And we're happy to do that. But I'd like to see a lot more come from that. And that's not for me to speak of or to decide. I'm very happy to so support these things. So I'm hopefully setting up a Facebook page to follow up from this yeah. so that this isn't the end of it. It's just the beginning. Yeah. So just to let everybody know that we do have copies um, at the museum. We will be also donating it to the libraries. But I think we do also have some copies for sale. And we are selling them for 150 Rand a book. If you're interested, you can contact me or uh, probably Mary. Um, my details are on the poster, but I'll give you my email, which is education at simonsteinmuseum.co.za. Very simple. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much for um, making the time to, to share your story with us. Yes, sorry, there's a question there with comment from Chanel. Yeah? Yes. So I, I, I did kind of skim through the book and um, it's always great when you see a familiar face. And so on page 96, I saw um, a lovely lady that a lot of us know, Mary Ann um, Kindo. So I don't know if Paul or Mark, do you maybe want to share what the connection is um, there with Mary Ann and her family? Um, yeah, because I see she made a cameo in the book. We try yes. and see if I can show it. 
<laughs> well, I mentioned in the book, and I should have said that uh, Granny Matthews, who looked after us and was effectively our granny, she is Mary and Kimdo's grandmother. And there was an important thing in the second edition, actually, I felt to add to those stories. So I tell the story of the Kimdo family, which is an astonishing story, as well as the Cotton family, which is Paul referenced his friend Daryl Felix, which is their story. There are so many stories that bring people to Simonstown, and I felt it was important that some of those should be seen and read. So Mary, yes, that is the connection, a very powerful and emotional connection for us. <laughs> oh, and we see Mary and waving the... <laughs> Yeah. And I should credit my sister Claire, that's her drawing. She's a proper artist. That was her drawing of Granny Matthews. <laughs> okay. Um, Chanel, do you want to go ahead and do the closing then and the announcement for the next session, maybe? Sure, sure. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to Paul and Mark for um taking the time to be with us today and to share your story and just being so generous by sharing um copies of your book with the museum and um even your your vision to like share it with schools because i think you know it's these stories need to be documented and they need to be told to the youth um and the young people because sometimes we forget about the struggles that um, people endured the trauma that people endured for the freedom that we enjoy today. So it's so important for us to, to hear these stories and really acknowledge um, the trauma, the pain, the fight. Um, and so, so those people also know that what they did was not in vain. Um, so we appreciate you sharing your story um, with us. Um, and we also appreciate everybody coming out uh, today and um, or this evening and listening to to Paul and Mark's story and thank you for your interest thank you for your time um, for those of you who are using data I know the data struggle is a real so thank you so much for um, spreading some data for this evening's um, zoom session um, yeah and so like this name said we're hoping to have um, for this to continue as the video series so we're going to take a week break just to you know um, get here and make up on board and, and get to the next um, guest speaker. Um, so our next video um, series will be on the 14th of October. So we hope that all of you will come out again. Please watch our social media platforms. So that's the Cape Town Museum of Childhood. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I think the uh, Simon Scum Museum is on Facebook and Facebook. So please make sure that you follow our pages and watch out for um, our adverts for the next um, special guest. Um, yeah, and again, just thank you so much for the time. Um, we have recorded the session, so if you'd like to um, get a copy of the recording, I think you can just email us Nim, um, and I know she will gladly give you um, the copy. So thank you so, so much. Um, it's lovely to see so many faces. Um, and thanks for the interaction. Thanks for the thumbs up. Thanks for the high fives. Um, thanks for coming back in again after we had to end the previous session. Um, we really, really do appreciate it. And I look forward to, I mean, if this is the beginning of this video series, I can just imagine that the next few is just going to be amazing again. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, that's all from my side, from Chanel, from the Cape Town Museum of Childhood. Thank you to Nim Bentel from Simon Stam Museum. We see Kathy here also as well from Simon Stam Museum. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Have a good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and hopefully we'll see you again on the 14th of October. Wait, Goodbye. wait, wait. wait, wait hold so on. Can we get a copy of the presentation? <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I don't know. Can we get a copy of the presentation to everyone who's attended, please. Thank you. I'm sure we can do that, Tasneem. Okay. Um, I wanted to say, Chanel, can we take a picture, you know, of this mosaic of everybody's faces? Um, it will be, it of looks course. pretty good from my side. Um, good idea, my, that's a good idea. How do I print screen here? Copy, copy, copy. But you one. must give us a countdown, Tasneem, so we can be ready. So Just people me, have their selfie faces seconds. and people have their poses. <laughs> Give me two seconds, give me two seconds. I'm just Googling how to print, how to screenshot on a Mac. Shift, command, three. Okay, got it.
Shiv. Okay, and I love how some people who didn't have videos have come out. So I'm glad that you've come out. I see your okay. poses are ready. Great, ladies and gentlemen. Let's okay. do this. <laughs> Count down. Five, four, three, two, one. Thumbs up. Okay, one more. This I need this is a second part. One, two, three, go. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, thanks everybody. so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.